Support comes from Thomas Nelson Community College, now becoming Virginia Peninsula Community College, the first choice to start a bachelor's degree since tuition is one-third the cost of four-year schools. More at tncc.edu. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever. Whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Millions of Americans breathed a sigh of relief when the Biden administration announced forgiveness of up to $20,000 of student loan debt to borrowers making less than $125,000 a year. This is especially good news for the more than 30% of black families that owe compared to 20% of white and 14% of Latinx families. With this good news comes many questions about the program and exactly who is qualified. Up next on Another View, answers to your questions about student loan forgiveness. But first, this news from NPR and WHRO News. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. We want to give a special shout out and hello to Danielle Sanders. She is the newest WHRO intern. She is from Newport News, and she's a junior at Full Sail University in Orlando, Florida. So she's back home, not enjoying the sunshine right now. (laughs) So welcome, Danielle. Danielle, and thank you. We're so excited that you're interested in radio. So if you are an African-American and carrying student loan debt, then you know firsthand the impact this debt has on your life. For everyone else, let me give you some perspective. According to the research organization Education Data Initiative, more black students take out student loans, 71 percent compared to 56 percent. On average, black college graduates owe $25,000 more in student debt than their white counterparts based on Department of Education statistics. And four years after graduation, 48 percent of black students owe almost 13 percent more than they borrowed. That number comes from the Education Data Initiative. So how will this federal debt relief program work? Joining us with some answers is Jasper Hendricks, Executive Director of the National Association of Black Elected Legislative Women. Hello, Jasper. How are you? Hello, Barbara. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much. Uh, And also joining us is Professor Chinadu Okala. He is Associate Dean at the College of Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University. Hello, Chinadu, are you with us? Hi, how are you? (laughs) Good, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining me. And lastly, Ray Henderson. He is president and CEO of the Henderson Financial Group. How are you, Ray? I am doing well. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining me. And audience, I want to put out the phone number now because I know there are a lot of people out there who have questions about student loans and the forgiveness program. The number to call is 757-440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. That's 757 757- Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. Give us a call with the questions that you have about the Biden administration's student loan forgiveness program. So, Jasper, I'm going to start with you. Let's do the basics. Exactly, what is this program, and who's eligible, and et cetera. So, pretty much, the administration is utilizing a. Uh, a law that was created after September 11th uh, that will give that gives the president and the executive branch the authority to forgive debt uh, in the wake of national disasters or national pandemics to help mm-hmm. relieve citizens. So this is so this is something that's you know been in place 
um, it's been utilized. Um, it was utilized, you know, just as recently as the um, under the, in the Trump administration uh, to delay student loan payments. Um, but the this administration has decided to take it a step further mm-hmm. and to um, and to um, and to forgive loans um, up to up to twenty thousand dollars. So it's ten thousand dollars. You know, for certain people, up to ten thousand dollars, but then tw- up to twenty thousand dollars if you receive Pell Grant. Okay. Uh, and we have to say up to because just if you have seven thousand dollars worth of loans, you know, it's gonna it may erase those seven thousand dollars. It doesn't mean that you're gonna get ten thousand dollars, right? Uh, or three thousand dollars in cash, you know, in in your bank account. So we want to make sure that people understand that. Uh, and so this is designed. This was created uh, by the Biden administration to help people. During this time, you know, we see that inflation has, you know, is causing prices of bread and milk to skyrocket, you know, to, and gas to skyrocket. Mm-hmm. Um, so what the administration is saying is that, hey, we're going to, we understand. Uh, and so we're going to offer you some help and we're going to do what we, what we can to help uh, many people because this is going to impact uh, you know, millions of people across the country. Okay, so you have to make a certain amount of money. Right. Or you can't be over a certain amount of money. You can't be over one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year uh, for a single person or two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a couple. And this is based on your twenty twenty and or twenty twenty one tax filing. So it's one or the other. It's not both. Right. Correct. Okay. So okay. it's one or the other. So if you file taxes in 2020, they're going to base it on the 2020. Um, it, it, you know, some people didn't, may not have filed taxes in 20. Uh, 20, but they filed taxes in 2021. Um, and so it is based on, you know, income, uh, you know, and so they already have the data on people. So that's how they know how much this is going to cost, because if you file taxes, your know, information is already in the IRS database that they can look and see how many people have made, you know, who, uh, when you file your taxes, how many people have made less than, you know, these amounts. So if you... Um... And if you make, if you're married and you can make up to $250,000, is that correct? Correct. For a for couple. For, yes. Per couple. For couple. Okay. Yes. And is the interest that is charged on these loans, is that also forgiven? Well, that is a sticky point. So some, it depends. Uh, and so uh, they, that's one of the, the areas in which they're trying to finalize the details. And we'll know a little bit more about that as before the rollout happens. Um, but that is um, a sort of one of those little pins that they just, you know, one of the little wrinkles that, we, that they're trying to uh, iron out at this at this moment. OK, now these are federal loans. Is that correct? correct? On federal loans, it does not include private school loans, even if they do eventually turn over into a federal loan. So these are uh, particularly federal loans uh, that students have had to take out in order to. Mm-hmm. to uh, enroll in school. And the and the determination about the amount of money you um your income is the adjust the adjusted gross income, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. All right. So so it really has to come from your uh tax return. Correct. In terms yes. of to determine that. Okay. Um yes. so this question is for each of you and that is uh, an article just came out in the Washington Post this morning. The headline reads Republicans are readying lawsuits to block Biden's student debt plan. GOP attorneys general, top lawmakers and conservative groups are discussing legal options alleging the White House's move to cancel student debt is illegal. I want to get your response to that. Chenadu, let's start with you. Um, interestingly, uh, when things go to become legal court matters, you don't know where that's going to end or something. But my perspective is largely guided by the students I have had the opportunity to teach, mentor, advice, and counsel over the years. Mm-hmm. And yes, a lot would depend on what comes out of the court if it ever goes to court. But the key thing in the meantime is to consider the burden all these young people have to bear as a result of student loan debt. We're talking about difficulties sometimes in purchasing daily needs for people who have a college degree just because they are saddled by debt. And when you look at those things, you begin to look at 
the whole idea of trying to move forward in a society doing the right things, but by dint of circumstance, begin to suffer. And the population that I primarily serve, which is made up largely of African American and brown students, are mm-hmm. disproportionately represented because most of them, for other reasons probably well known by now, live at home and don't really have the means to expand in all these ways possible. So some have trouble trying to buy basic needs. And then those people who even want to do better are beginning to count themselves out of the housing market because they don't see how it's going to happen because the the debt load is just so high and it's crippling, Mm. you know. And uh, these are people who rely on to solve problems of society, do some critical thinking, and move things forward. And they're good contributors to the economy. So it's really heavy. And uh, whatever relief they might get would be really helpful in more ways than one. I'm sure there are savvy economic moves that can be made to ameliorate whatever um, adverse consequences have been foretold by many. But, you know, if we stick with the realities and leave the political parts of it, maybe we can do more. With citizens. With, with citizens moving forward. Um, Ray, the, we got a, a messenger, a, a message from one of our listeners, Ray Russell, who says, quote, it's obvious that the student loan forgiveness is a ploy by the Biden administration to garner votes for the midterms. It's also very obvious that this action is unconstitutional. The executive branch cannot absolve debt at this magnitude without congressional legislation. Expect a hearing in federal court in the near future. Um, um, I'm wondering what your reaction is to those who say this is totally unfair and, you know, if you got student loans, you need to pay them. Um, this is Ray Henderson. Yes. Uh, there's there's definitely uh, that sentiment out there, and I, and I interact with those folks quite a bit, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, however, comment the disparities are real, right? The, the gaps, the wealth gaps, the opportunities, the ability to repay, the post-college experience, all of those things that hit African Americans at another level that most people don't realize and really can't sympathize with are very, very real. So I think it's a very complex issue to unpack. Um, should you borrow money you can't repay? Of course not. But however, comma, how do you get ahead in this society where there's there's really no start if you don't come out with a college degree? So I, I think that's a loaded statement, obviously, but I, mm-hmm. I definitely can see the struggle. I mean, the struggle, the strap, the, the, like you said, you have 23, 24, 25 year olds still living at home because they just can't. So there's, there's a larger issue at hand here and we do need relief in our community, uh, whether this is it. And, and, and as we know, many folks owe so much more than they're going to receive in this, but it's yeah. going to help do something. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to help do something. Um, because we've got to get from under this. There's a whole a different approach that you can take with how you tackle debt, and we help with that on a day-to-day basis. But there's got to be a jump start because the opportunities just don't abound for these students coming out of school. Yeah, and we're going to talk to you in more detail about some of those other ways that you can help to mitigate um, this. But Jasper, I'm curious, since you are right smack in the middle of the whole legislative piece, what do you? what's your reaction? <laughs> I mean, it's just unfortunate that, you know, we do have a group of people that just refuses to work with anyone and they're completely against everything that the opposite party or the party that they're not a part of, um, you know, to, is trying to do. Again, as I mentioned as I, when I opened up, this is the same law that the Trump administration used to actually pause the um, the payment. You know, and those and payments so, right they, now are no, paused. Are paused through um, January of twenty three. Is that right? They're supposed to restart. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. And there were no challenges during this time. No challenges whatsoever. They didn't mm-hmm. take it to court. They didn't. They didn't say anything about it. You know, it was. It was fine. You know, but now, you know, um, when the Biden administration is looking to help, you know, those less fortunate, then you have a problem. These are also the same people who actually took PPP loans and are forgiven and and were forgiven and didn't have to pay it back, Mm -hmm. you know, and so, and they didn't have a problem with that, you know, with those either. And so, you know, and so, and I think we have to take it with a grain of salt is that we have some people who just continuously want to be miserable people, 
mm-hmm. and they want to be complainers, you know, and they want to try to hinder progress. And so, and they do it in any way that they can, uh, because they just don't have their way at this, at this present time. And so, but what we, and we also have to understand that just because a person says it's illegal does not mean that it actually is illegal, you know, but it's yeah. going to be up to the Biden administration, which they've actually laid out, you know, they, before they even made this announcement, the Department of Justice released a 25 page memo outlining, you know, how this is legal. And again, the law states, and so as the listener put in the chat message that mm-hmm. is a congressional action, Congress took this action in 2003 and passed the law that would that gives the uh, executive branch the authority to forgive debt in the wake of a national of natural disasters and um and pandemics of this such. Mm-hmm. And so and so yeah, so you may try to say and say, oh well, it's just the Biden administration trying to get votes. You know, I mean, it's not like we're trying to it, we're not like try, we're trying to steal an election as we saw this past, you know, couple of years. Okay. All right. Chinadu um Okala, let me ask you this. Can you give us a specific example of a student, um, obviously with no names, but that you have worked with, um, what kinds of struggles they're actually going through, um, trying to pay the student loan and be a productive citizen? Okay, let me see what I can select from recent interactions. Okay, I have, because I still talk to this former student, Mm -hmm. I have a student who graduated, earned a graduate degree as an architect in the the following transactions, who for the last three, four years struggled with the whole burden of the debt. He's been trying to open a business. Well, let's go back a little bit. This same student called um, six, seven years ago. They've been out of college a while, which Mm -hmm. is why this whole debt thing is crippling, has tried from the day they left school to get into the housing market, and they gave up. Now, they tried to buy a house. It wasn't working well. Again, by the time they get through paying their obligation to student loans, it becomes really, really difficult to do other things. And just to add to the perspective shared earlier on African-American students, the burden of loans, of course, it, it comes under the umbrella of college loans, tuition loans. But this student in particular, who is my example case, had to live off loans through college. There was no other means. I mean, the university mm-hmm. would do all it can in terms of financial aid, but there's a limit. Now, when somebody is fundamentally disadvantaged economically, okay, EFC of zero, Mm -hmm. and still, you know, there's no expected family contribution of any kind, but they have to make it. And this student travels from a state like California to Virginia to go to school. You find out that this becomes extraordinarily complicated. So every simple thing becomes even more difficult because they owe money. Credit ratings are lower. So they can't really borrow at favorable terms if they get to borrow Mm -hmm. to do some other things. So it's a cycle. You're trying to pay what you owe, but you have to borrow to get other things done. Uh, But you have a job. Right. Just because your intentions haven't panned out well, given financial um, conditions and tidal waves, you know, and the, the, the frustrating part, really, when you look at it is that of course, political stripes would always adhere to its original ideas and ideologies and beliefs. But there are people at the end of all these policies and probably strategizing for order to win elections and vote on the rest of it. And these people are the real face of the economy. And when you hear we're doing X, Y, Z for the people, for the citizens, and on the other hand, what appear to be powerful measures are not giving full service then you keep scratching your head on what else to do. So I have a student who can buy a house, who cannot start a business. Brilliant, brilliant student. Wonderful idea that could actually help society quickly if they could set up their own shop. But they cannot because they owe student loans. Because they owe so you know? much, yeah. yeah. They owe so much in student loans, and they just can't make it happen. You know, When you owe twenty, twenty-five, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, not out of your own making, but because you're still trying to get along and get ahead, something should be done to consider those people. I am not sure 
that anyone sets out to take a college loan because they don't want to pay it back. Actually, the real reason they're in trouble is that they are really paying it back. They're being faithful citizens trying to honor their commitment. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and again, it, it makes you look at the whole bankruptcy law system, which doesn't include student loan debt. People use economic resets called bankruptcies every now and then to get another jump start. You can't do that with your <clears> student <throat> loan. So we have these students, and again, I think a lot of people are involved, you know, African Americans, non African Americans, white people, dif different different uh, ethnic denominations here. Mm -hmm. But the disproportionate um, burden on my African American students, or my brown, Latinx, and Hispanic students, and other minorities, is just, you know, one of those things that demands constant attention because, mm -hmm. again, it is heavy. Mm -hmm. You're not buying a house, you're not starting a business. And your employment seems to be losing value because when you figure inflation and everything else and what you have to pay out, it doesn't even follow or really match the pace because you're really owning less money after paying what you're obligated to pay. Right. But yes, it's good to pay back if you borrow. But at the same time, what happens when you really cannot? Okay. There's got to be a way out of this thing. Okay, let's four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call to uh, join us to talk about this student loan debt. Let's talk to Catherine in Norfolk. Hi, Catherine. Katrina. I'm sorry. How are you? Hi. Good. Thank you for uh, taking my call. Uh huh. Uh, this is a subject that really is home for me because um, I'm a first generation college student. Um, and I accrued some debt, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. um, that's over six figures now. And to try and overcome that on a teacher's salary is going to be the challenge of my life. Mm. So while $10,000 is a great amount, it's a start for only some of us. Um, and beyond that, I just, if you don't mind, I just wanted sure. to say that, um, you know, for the 20 years or so that I've that I worked waiting tables, uh, you know, different labor jobs. Just You know, I've worked 20 years of my adult life. Um, before I went to college, you know, the idea was if you don't want to work for low wages, go to college. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I did, and I was very successful in school. Um, I made really good grades. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity that I'll always be grateful for. It changed my life. But then there are the very same people um, who told us, you know, go to school if you don't want to work for low wages. They're the very same people who say, don't take out loans if you can't afford college. So right. I'm just wondering if the point is that you just don't want working people to do better. Mm. Um, because, or if I was supposed to save $60,000 on my $10 an hour job, in addition to trying to pay over 1000 in rent. Right. So I'm just, I'm thinking that for some people, for some people, the point is cruelty, and they don't want the working class to do better than they have in the past, and yet still continue to sell the narrative that if you work hard, you go to school, you gain an education, you can be successful. Gotcha. Um, yeah, let so me, it's let society me... sort of talks out of both sides of its mouth, you know? <laughs> Thanks so much for the call, Katrina. We, and we wish you the best of luck going forward. Ray, uh, you hear the frustration in her voice because she wants to do the right thing and pay back these loans. But but what are the alternatives that people will have if they can't take out student loans in terms of going to school? It's, it's very crippling. It's very difficult. My wife and I were talking about it this morning, who, who's also a teacher. Mm -hmm. Um the, the, the issue is that incomes are not rising at the same rate, right? The, the level at which the college tuition, all of the costs included that people have to borrow for, are they're skyrocketing. And when you come out, again, as a teacher or any other type of profession where you've gone three, four, five years for the degree, the raises on that end are not keeping up at all. So most students are going back to school, accumulating more debt. What we're doing is a is, is an attack approach through what we call snowball debt snowball, and it's it's a little it's well known, but the way we attack it is a little bit differently because some folks will do it by interest rate. We do it by what I call bang for the buck per month. So mm -hmm. whatever amount is smallest owed but has the highest payment, 
we start that one first and we may pause the other. But as soon as we can get some relief through your own debt snowball and then roll that into the next one and to the next one, it really is a tailored approach. But it's, it's difficult. Incomes are not keeping up. We can't we can't keep going down this road. Um, because it is crippling. Yeah. If you're just joining us, we're answering your questions about student loan debt relief with Jasper Hendricks, Executive Director, National Organization of Black Elected Legislative Women, Professor Chinadu Okala, who is an Associate Dean at the College of Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University, and Ray Henderson, who is President and CEO of Henderson Financial Group, 757-440-2665 or 1-800-940- 2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation. What questions do you have about getting ready so that you can have this debt relieved um, through the Biden administration's new program? So, um, Jasper, let me ask you this. First of all, the the um, program, does this also apply to graduate students? Well, right now it's, it's, uh, it's really good towards uh, undergraduate loans. Okay. Okay. Uh, at this time, yeah. And is that so, also the parent loans, the plus loans? Um, yes. Yeah. So as long as it's a federal uh, loan that your parent, that you know, the uh, it, it, as long as you participated in that federal parent plus loan, yes. Okay. And if um, if you're in arrears um, on your loan now, can you still participate? Well, no. So, and that's one thing that I think that with the pause in the federal in the payments, I think is allowed people to. Uh, sort of catch up. And so I think right now everyone is on the same level playing field. You know, mm-hmm. and as the last caller uh, stated, as Katrina stated, like this is a start also. And to let people know that this is a start. And so, but in order to do more, we have to have elected officials that are willing to sit down and work with people to come up with solutions and not just saying no. And so, you know, and so all the, you know, so although this is a, a great program and it's going to impact, it's going to help many people, there's still a lot of work to be done. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Amy reached out to us on Messenger. Her quote was, the way interest accrues on these loans and the predatory behavior of student loan servicers, many owe much more than they borrowed in the first place. I believe the student loan forgiveness is a good thing, but without major reforms to the system, the problem isn't going away. Ray, what are some practical ways, because as interest continues to, to um, grow, you do wind up mo- owing more than what you actually borrowed. So what do you advise people to do? I know you were talking about paying off the the um, highest interest rate first and moving to the next and to the next, but are there other things that you can do? Yes, yes. And actually, to go back to Katrina and also answer this one, the, mm-hmm. I'm sure we'll get to this, but the public service loan forgiveness yeah. with 120 payments is something to also keep on the radar for those working in nonprofits or in public service. So that is one opportunity that's still out there that we want to take advantage of um, that's still on the table. But in terms of attacking the interest, I always try to advise clients to at least pay the interest if you can so that it is, that it isn't accruing as much. You may not be able to tackle principal and interest, but, you know, that's, that's got to be a start. Until we get some other opportunities, um, that accrual and that compounding is what really makes this sickening over time. A lot of folks start off with thirty or forty thousand, and I'm seeing people today. You know, they're earning sixty thousand and owe a hundred and twenty, mm-hmm. and and it's just like how, <laughs> you know, with rent at two thousand, you know, and mm-hmm. student loan payments at thirteen hundred, and you're only bringing home three or four thousand. I mean, it's 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 just not doable. So. Interest payments is the beginning. Um, Federal loans, which are ideally, you know, subsidized and and federal loans are most ideal. You don't want to ideally you don't want to refinance to private um, because you're going to remove yourself from eligibility from programs like this. Um, But at least covering interest um, to keep that from accruing is the beginning. Growing your income. We, We talk to folks a lot about taking on additional work. You know, I have four sons teaching them, unfortunately, about working two jobs, you know, and, and what can you do to bring in more dollars to attack this? But with the mountain so large, there's there's definitely an impact that's needed. 757-440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Jan- Jasmine joins us from Portsmouth. Hi, Jasmine. You're on the air. 
Hey, it's Jessamine. Oh, right. Jessamine, I'm, I'm sorry. How are you? Okay. Good. Go ahead. What's uh, your question? Well, it's a comment, and the comment is about um, the advice that's given to younger people who are considering their futures when they're looking at going to college, and also about the the policy that's being made. And in both of those cases, it's dominated by people who came up during an era when college was so much more expensive. And I, I think I see this particularly on the policy side, because so many of our elected officials, not all of them, but very, very many of them um, are certainly older than um, older than the average, you know, older than my parents, a lot of them. And even when I was, you know, looking at going to college, it was um, like a, like your prior co- caller had said, it was, you know, go to college, get a good job. And I think that that's really important. I'm, I happen to be a teacher too, and mm-hmm. I will always encourage motivated students to go to college, but it's not enough to say go to college. And I think we really need to be careful about the kind of college bound advice that excuse me, the kind of college related advice that we give college bound students. You know, we need to help them plan really specifically. We need to help them look at look from the beginning at what their outcome is, not just go to college and figure out when you figure it out when we get there. And I also think that I'm really inspired by a lot of the younger elected officials that are taking on this issue who can relate. You know, some of them mm-hmm. have said that they have six-figure debt and so forth. And a lot of us hear that loud and clear. And so I'm really encouraged about maybe what can be done on a policy level in the future as well. Okay. Thank you so very much for the call. We appreciate that. Jasper, what are some, so what do we need to do if you have a student loan now? Um, are there any steps you need to take right now to make sure that your information is where it's supposed to be so that you can be considered for this debt relief? Yes, I would uh, just recommend everyone uh, to go on the Department of Education's website. Mm-hmm. They have a um, they have a section where you can sign up to receive the update. Um, more details for the program will be out come you know mid to early uh, October. Uh, so we, um, you know, and we, and, but as, uh, but if you sign up for those updates, they, you will be notified as to, you know, some of the, uh, latest information that is being, uh, sort of, sort of worked out. Um, because it's, it's a little bit more than just the $10,000 or the $20,000 that we talked about. This, uh, this rule had be what the president has done also was work on some of the reforms that were mentioned that was needed, you know, so as far as, for example, income-based repayment programs. So Mm -hmm. if you do owe more, you know, and so like I think the typical nurse, you know, who makes $70,000 a year will, you know, see a monthly payments drop, you know, to $60 a month, for example, and and save them, you know, over the course of the year. And it will um, also, they're also making uh, adjustments to the way that the interest rates have, uh, a, you know, is being applied to these programs. So, so like I said, there's a little bit more details in there. So I know a lot of people talking about that ten and twenty thousand dollars. But if you sign up, you go to, um, you know, ed.gov, ed.gov, and go to the U.S. Department of Education's website. Mm-hmm. Sign up for the alerts and 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 get the information yourself. You know, um, and straight from straight from them. Uh, as we continue to work out the details of each program. Of right. Program. So, because part of this this program, um, right now, you are charged ten percent of your discretionary income, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in terms of the repayment, and they're trying to drop that to five percent. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. So that would be less money. So, Ray, let me ask you this: If there will be some students who this debt will be erased, um, so what do, what should they do with the money if they don't have to pay their student loan anymore? Well, praise God for that. So if they get erased <laughs> and they have the, the free cash flow, we need to begin to uh, start accumulating with gold. Do not uh, take that money and go put it into something you can't show for it five years later. So gold accumulation, wealth is still primarily passed through home ownership. You know, I'm a big mm-hmm. advocate for real estate, uh, getting yourself in position if you're a first-time home buyer, so accumulating that down payment. Ideally, 20% is great so you don't pay um, private mortgage insurance, but I think you can do as little as three, three and a half, five percent, or no money down. But getting into ownership, you know, starting a business, something where you own and can control a bit more of the future equity, um, you know, that, those dollars need all, ca- all all dollars are an investment, is what I teach our clients. Even cash is an investment. 
Mm-hmm. So if you accumulate cash, the only return it gives you is dollar for dollar. You need to accumulate in something that has the opportunity to give you more than that dollar for dollar. Mm-hmm. And if, if those who still will have a, a balance left over, um, do you have some tips on managing their finances while they continue to still pay off the loan? Absolutely. I highly recommend uh, doing a consultation with someone who understands that snowballing. Again, we see a lot of folks say you have three different loans and they all total 40000 you know, 13000 each. Folks will do a little bit more money on each one and they never move the needle. You got to focus. You have to put a tack on, again, the bang for the buck. Which one is the smallest balance with the highest payment? Knock that one out first. So if that's $100 a month, then you roll that $100 into the next one where you're maybe paying $300 a month. So now you're paying $400, knock that balance out next. You pay minimums on anything you're not focused on knocking out, and you will get through that debt faster um, than spreading it out. You know, you just said something really, really important, though, because it, when people think of, of doing it this way, they're thinking they're not paying on the other bills. But what you said was pay the minimum. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got a budget to be able to keep them afloat. The minimum should cover the interest, we hope, so that doesn't continue to capitalize. But then we're going to focus. Again, the power of focus. And it's amazing to show people if you stay with what you're on, you know, you'll be paid off in 23 years. But if you focus mm-hmm. three, four, five, six years sometimes, it's, it's amazing. Okay. And is there a way to repair your credit if you run into trouble with paying your student loans? Um, there is. There, there, there are, you know, I, I, took, I take the slower approach, you know, where we actually see what caused it and how much time it takes. Sometimes things are errors. We pull the credit reports. I have folks review them annually. But you can repair your credit. You can rebuild it. It depends on what, what messed it up. If it's, if it's payment history, that you legitimately didn't pay, you will have to wait that out. However, comma, you can do some other things because all of your credit score is not just payment history. It's balances, so amount owed. It's how long you've had certain lines open. And then it's also payment history and a few other factors. So we can work on some of the things we can control while we're waiting time out and and still set a goal of when you can buy some larger items with it. So, Chinadu, I keep hearing about these... Um, grants that are available for students, but that they, a lot of times they go unfulfilled, that people don't fill them out, fill out the applications or, or whatever. How are you advising students who are in school now to um, do certain things to mitigate the amount of money they may owe once they get done? Um, Well, it's really a, a number of components that go into that whole practice. Uh, First of all, like Ray said, is to be able to do enough uh, due diligence and pursue every lead that says grant everything, that says free money of any kind. Um, students would be well served to make time for it. Of course, it's probably part of the habit of young people to be bored about things. But um, in monetary issues, I don't encourage boredom at all. As a matter of fact, uh, we have a lot of inclusive advising in my environment at the university where students are counseled on debt and this different approach is to start attacking them to make sure they don't even uh, balloon or give festering. The other part is that we do it the best we can, and I think there's always room for improvement, to make sure that students are on a very tightly uh, woven path to the degree because the longer you stay in school, the more debt you accumulate. Mm-hmm. So, of course, we try to provide all the support services to make sure you get out as soon as possible, which means if you can get out in less than four years, that would be the very best option. The next best option is to make sure your four-year journey doesn't turn to a longer pilgrimage. And, right. of course, four things. So the idea there is to make sure that interventions are in place, which I think we're doing a fairly decent job of it this stuff to university, to have students become aware of these sources and avenues. And we're pretty aggressive in the way we introduce students to scholarship opportunities, mm-hmm. to um, emerging sources where they can find other monies. Because in, in, in the real situation, there are about so many hours in a day. So if, if one were to right. depend on getting extra jobs to make more money alone, well... 
you would run out of time in the day to get all the jobs, no matter how well intentioned. So it is the ability to hone in, become disciplined, and uh, like we said, become focused on those avenues that seem to put more resources at, resources at one's mm-hmm. disposal that we begin to get to. And it's always a mix of things. You know, well, I find it very interesting you when you were talking about, um, for example, making sure that you you arrange your school schedule so that you can get out within four years. I know I went to college 100 years ago, but <laughs> but this idea of, of five, six, seven year treks, um, I understand some people have to work um, outside of the school day. So that's what lengthens that time but but really you should spend a lot of time with your advisors to help you to get through in four years correct true yes of course that's what we normally will advocate for students to do but like you said life Mm -hmm. happens and when that happens we try to accommodate it the good thing about our systems of advising especially at the university i speak of things i know Mm -hmm. uh, is that it's very focused on intensively and intrusively (coughs) guiding students and we do make ourselves available to have that conversation. It is not really a feasted party for you to enjoy. Some parts of being a student are rather difficult. Mm-hmm. And it is mm-hmm. that commitment to become, you know, to develop some degrees of efficacy that makes it happen. And when students become that resourceful in that way, guided by the rules in place, we tend to see better results. Mm-hmm. Yes, we want you out in four years. And... I'm glad you mentioned talk to your advisor. I know, you know, I've been young some million years ago, too. <laughs> but there's something, there's, there's a benefit of wisdom. Talking to people who mm-hmm. know and who, more importantly, are committed to a culture of care where your interest is really, you know, what's, what's been looked out for, mm-hmm. your best interest. Mm-hmm. So when students come in and they try to get the talk, but, you know, young people are what they are particularly. <laughs> and if, if you come in and, of course, give them a nice talk, but maybe two days later it's different. So we continue to try to get them to understand that um, these advisors are available to you. See your advisor. Your advisor is your best bet. Yeah. If I'm committed mm-hmm. to getting you out of college, I would do anything humanly possible that's not illegal to get you out. Right, exactly. And, you know, it means I have to give you a Saturday class. Okay, you know, don't yeah. go out on Friday yeah. night and try to party too much because you have a Saturday class. But, you know, you do those things incrementally. And for students who have other challenges, because there are many challenges, believe it, you know, we still try to address those challenges enough to make sure there's a customizable approach because there's no one-size-fits-all. Absolutely. People's are very different. Right. And, and so, so we try to get them, you know, yes, to work within what we have. Exactly, exactly. Right. let me ask you this question. Um, what should parents and students think about in terms of financing higher education going forward? Oh, yes, thank you. This is exactly <laughs> what I wanted to chime in on, because having four sons, I have one in college. One thing I would start is in high school, look at dual enrollment. Um, And a lot of folks have done the two-year TCC and then transfer to university. Mm -hmm. Anything you can knock out early at a cheaper credit, you know, dollar per credit hour is the way to go. I think Portsmouth led this year on how many came out of high school with their associates. So transferability, you want to work with your counselor and your advisor, but that's the first thing. Try to knock out. I, I was in 11th grade when I started dual enrollment. My son was in 11th grade. He did dual enrollment. Uh, Mm -hmm. a year or two at Regent. He went to, he's at UVA now, he went to UVA the summer prior um, to enrolling and got six more credits. So he went in with 12, he went in with at least a semester under his belt. And it was much more affordable. So if you can start tackling, you know, I'm all about this, try to get these students doing summer school, dual enrollment, you know, jobs are good, but they can knock out a lot of this education (laughs) early. And even if they'll do a year or two and then transfer in, that is your best financing because you're not you're just not paying as much. And um, it, that worked out really, really well. But in terms of saving for education outside of loans, there are education accounts like 529 investment accounts, Coverdell, et cetera. Mm-hmm. 
um, income-driven opportunities with Pell Grants, et cetera. So we really need to take a holistic approach of what's your family contribution expectation, what's your revenue, what's your income looking to be like as a household. But then, again, start these children out early and get them into these college courses 15, 16 years old. Yeah, so you have to do your research. Jasper, we only got about two minutes left, but I want to ask you about the scammers out there because there's always somebody out there trying to say, oh, I can help you get your student loan loan reduced or or whatever. What should people watch out for, in ter- <laughs> especially in this new process that's coming up? Yes, so you would go to ed.gov and sign up. That's the only way in the most okay. reliable places you can get your information um it's straight from the source also those people who are you know teachers you work in government you uh, work in healthcare, you work at a nonprofit. you can go to pflf.gov and figure out how you can get credit for your time at work and you know, um, for for your work that you've done over the years. And it doesn't have to be 10 consecutive years, you mm-hmm. know, of work now. That's one of the changes that has, that uh, that is being taken place. Um, so ed.gov and pslf.gov. And if all else fails, go to whitehouse.gov and, and find, get the information. And get that information that you need. <laughs> right. That if is... it don't end in .gov, I wouldn't trust <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That is Jasper Hendricks, Executive Director, National Organization of Black Elected Legislative Women. Professor Chinadu Okala, who is Associate Dean at the College of Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University. And Ray Henderson, President and CEO of the Henderson Financial Group. Gentlemen, thank you so much for this information. And we will be right back. Hi, this is Essie Patha Merkerson from Law and Order. You are listening to Another View. And welcome back. There's no right way to do something wrong is not just a quote, but a way of life for the man you are about to meet. You might think you know Elijah Cadillac Harris, a Hampton Roads native who spent four decades serving as the head coach of three local football teams. But Cadillac's journey from talented athlete to admired coach was not an easy one. He reflected on his life and his chosen path with our Lisa Godley. I started playing football in middle school and just fell in love with it. Elijah Cadillac Harris describes his life growing up as challenging. As children, he and his brothers worked on the family farm. This required he feed more than 100 hogs each morning before school and when needed, pick crops by hand. I can remember picking 30 bushes of cucumbers in one of the rows was as far as you could see. So that kind of living and then not having indoor plumbing until I was a junior in high school just made me a different kind of person. And so learning how to tackle hogs and getting them back to where they needed to be became very easy for me as a football player to tackle a person. And so the condition, unknown to me at the time that I hated, was actually one of the driving forces that caused me to really fall in love with playing the game. In fact... It was his middle school football coach who gave him the nickname Cadillac. At the time, unbeknown to me, I was his running back and linebacker and tight end in different formations. And I got in a couple games, and one in particular, I looked a mess. And he ended up having to give me another jersey. And he said, boy, you know what? You run just like my car, an old Cadillac, all beat up and dent up, but it gets me where I need to go. You do that for our football team. And the name stuck. Cadillac would go on to play for Kempsville High School. I was the only African-American kid on my team my senior year in high school. And I was elected captain of the team. And that was quite an experience in and of itself. He would spend his college career playing for the Norfolk State University Spartans. I really wanted to go to HBCU. And, and after a big football game against Kellum, in which I was able to scan up a pass and score the winning touchdown, my coach told me that Norfolk State wanted to see me Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. And after I took that visit, I didn't want to go anyplace else. I knew it was home. But with college football came injury. 
injuries, both to his shoulder and his knee. And even after rehab and taking time off, Cadillac says he wasn't as fast as he'd been. But that made him smart. It made me to become a coach because I had to dissect what the game plan was and decide how best to move from my position and take proper angles as an outside linebacker defensive end. He got a free agent trial with the Dallas Cowboys, but didn't make the team. So he returned home to coach and teach. But his dream of becoming a head football coach would be an uphill battle. I had tried for seven years to be a head football coach, and I happened to be in Virginia Beach. And so uh, there was uh, some pushback in that area, just a mindset that there were administrators and people of power who felt like uh, the city wasn't ready for a head black football coach yet. He credits mentors like Dick Price, Wally French, and Tommy Rhodes, who continued to advise and encourage him. I had been turned down from the job at Princeton Ann High School, and Wally French, who was my principal, took me down to the superintendent's office and he said it was the superintendent wanted to meet with me and he told me that I was the most qualified candidate for the job, but I can't give you the job because the city's not ready yet. And if you go over to Princess Ann High School, that principal is going to fire you as soon as the first white parent complains. Cadillac had won two state championships coaching track by the time he got the job as Green Run High School's first black head football coach in 1988. He would remain in that position for seven years. He became emotional when he shared what his friend Tommy Rhodes once told him. He said, you know, I hope you don't take this person, but I wouldn't want to be black for anything in the world because of what I've seen you go through. It's an emotional moment just to relive it. Cadillac would later serve as head coach at Maury and Indian River High Schools. He would spend 42 years as an educator and coach before retiring in 2021. And on August 26th, All he's given to sports was recognized when the Green Run Football Stadium was named after him. God, you've taken me from not being able to be a coach to now the place that I labored in is now being named after me. I couldn't ask for anymore. I couldn't be more filled. Cadillac is credited with coaching hundreds of athletes who went on to play college football, five who played in the NFL. He describes his ability to coach and spot talent in athletes as a gift. It's just something that God has given me, a gift to be able to see the potential that an athlete will have and then be able to give them the tools that's necessary for them to be successful at their craft. I try to give kids tools that they can be successful for a lifetime. And I love it when they come back and tell me that they're still using the same things as a father and the same things that they've learned on the field and they use those application in life. And that's a reward that's priceless. For another view... I'm Lisa Godley. And we are so proud of Cadillac Harris. The Green Run Stadium has been named the Cadillac Harris Stadium. And so that is just so very, very cool. And now that he's retired, Cadillac works on his honeydew list and with a project he's very proud of called the Real Man Pride Program, which is designed to help today's young people with character development. You know, we shared a lot of valuable information today that many in our community can use. So do me a favor and share this broadcast with a friend or family member. Just go to anotherviewradio.org and download the podcast. And while you're there, sign up for our eView newsletter. It's a once a week reminder of upcoming shows. We're on Facebook and I'm on Twitter at Barbara Ham Lee. Next week on Another View, wit and wisdom from the Another View Roundtable. So you know that's going to be a great time. Our theme music is an original composition created especially for Another View by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. And Dr. Barry Graham answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a fabulous Labor Day weekend. And let's get together again next Thursday at at noon for another view.
Support comes from Thomas Nelson Community College, now becoming Virginia Peninsula Community College, the first choice, whether starting your bachelor's degree or advancing your career. More at tncc.edu. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at hamptonroadscf.org.